Nurse 252 Pathology, Session 1, Introduction to Study of Diseases. My name is Professor Richard Jesse, and we want, I'll be talking to you about introduction to the study of disease. Overview. Welcome to our, your first session in pathology. In this session, you will be introduced to the study of diseases and the techniques used in pathology developed over the years. You will learn to name, classify, and identify characteristics of diseases. Activities that you will be doing include practicing definitions of terms, listing examples, and providing explanations for some of the things that you will learn. By the end of the session, you should be able to state and explain the historical development of pathology, define and explain each characteristic of disease, describe the relationships between various characteristics of disease, demonstrate the ability to use the characteristics of disease to describe a given disease. You must be able to explain the nomenclature used in describing diseases and also demonstrate the ability to use the correct nomenclature in describing various diseases. The key topics to be covered in this session are 1. History and development and scope of pathology. 2. Definition and characteristics of disease. 3. Classification of diseases. 4. Nomenclature of disease. Your reading list is 1. The Robbins and Cotran Pathologic Basis of Disease, 7th edition, you, 2010. You will find this in chapter 1 of Robbins and Cotran. So, the history and development of pathology. What is pathology? Pathology is the scientific study of disease. It constitutes a large body of scientific knowledge, ideas, and investigative methods essential for the understanding of and practice of modern medicine what you call, we will call Western medicine. So it includes the knowledge, the understanding of the structure, the functional changes at molecular level, at cellular level, tissue level, and organ level, and how it affects the individual. Now the concepts of disease causation have gone through many phases. So it has got a long history. Early history include the period of supernatural, where people believed the dominance of animism and magic, and diseases were attributed to adverse influence of supernatural forces. Then followed by the period of humors between 300 BC and about 1500 AD, where diseases were attributed to accumulation of body humors, like phlegm and bile, etc. Then came the period of abiogenesis before 1800 AD, when spontaneous generation of changes of disease was believed. That is, diseases arose spontaneously, such as by a process of metamorphosis and independent of external cause or influence. Finally, the period of modern pathology started around 1850, when environmental causation of disease became clear due to techniques such as autopsy, cellular pathology, toxicology, microbiology, epidemiology. Molecular biology in the 20th century has shown that genetic basis of many diseases is becoming clear. And there is a close interaction between the environment and the genes in disease causation. So that is the current understanding of disease. Could you now take a moment to think about the, what is present in Ghana? The question is, what are the beliefs of causation of disease in Ghana? Take a moment to think about it. And you will find that all the causations that we mentioned may come into your mind. Now, 
Let us introduce a few key individuals in the history of modern pathology. The first one is Louis Pasteur, a Frenchman. He demonstrated that microorganisms in the environment were the cause of the changes in substances, and he debunked the theories of abiogenesis. Next, Rudolf Vekov used a light microscope to demonstrate that changes at cellular level, which is also called cellular pathology, is the basis of disease. This has been extended to findings under electron microscopy. And during the 20th century, biochemistry advances has enabled the demonstration of disease at molecular level. So that currently, many of the cellular and clinical manifestations of disease may be explained by changes at the molecular level. Now let's move on to the scope of pathology. There are two main methods in the study of disease. Clinical pathology and experimental pathology. Clinical pathology is a study of disease based on the observation of the patients to find the cause and mechanisms of the disease and the effects of the disease on the various organs and systems of the body. Experimental pathology is observation of the effects on manipulation of experimental systems. For instance, animal models of disease or cell cultures may be used to study disease. The difficulty with this method is that it is extremely difficult to reproduce uh, in cell cultures the physiological milieu that prevails in the intact human body. However, these are very useful techniques that are used today. What are the subdivisions in pathology? Histopathology. This is where we study disease by examination of tissues. Cytopathology is the investigation of disease by examination of isolated cells. Hematology is when we apply these methods to the study of disorders of cells and the coagulation components in the blood. Microbiology is a study of infectious diseases and the organisms responsible for them. Immunology, a study of specific defense mechanisms. Chemical pathology, a study of disease that uses the chemical changes in the tissues and fluids. Genetics is when we look at ab for abnormal chromosomes and genes to explain disease. Toxicology is a study of the effects of known and suspected toxins. Forensic pathology is when we apply all these methods that we have mentioned previously to legal purposes. And these subdivisions are professions and specializations, but the subject of pathology and the study of disease is multidisciplinary. And the diseases do not respect any of these man-made divisions. Now let's move on to the techniques that we apply. The first one we'll talk about is gross pathology. This is naked eye appearance. We also call it macroscopic appearance. It's very useful. Many diseases have characteristic appearances from which confident diagnosis can be made with the naked eye. For instance, if an autopsy or examination of the dead body of a diseased person is looked at using the naked eye, you can do that before you do light microscopy. Now, the autopsy means see for oneself. It is also called necropsy or postmortem examination. It involves the direct inspection and analysis of organs. And it is done to determine cause of death. You can do it to audit the accuracy of clinical diagnosis, to educate undergraduates and postgraduates, and for research purposes. And it may yield the cause and the mechanisms of disease. So you can gather statistics also in order to come to a conclusion using the autopsy. 
The light microscopy is when you examine tissues under the microscope after processing the tissues into glass slides so you can look at them under the microscope. The processing of the tissue starts with preservation of the tissue in a state that fixes the cells in the condition at the time the sample was taken. This process is called fixation. The commonest fixative used is 10% buffered formalin solution. When tissue is sampled, the volume of this buffered formalin that must be used should be at least 10 times the volume of the tissue which is being fixed. This is important so that fixation will take place properly. The process of fixation hardens the tissue. So such tissues must not be placed in small necked bottles. Rather, use a wide neck container or a cylindrical container to enable the tissue to be removed with ease after the hardening. The tissue is then processed and impregnated with substances that will fill the spaces in the tissue. And the key one used is paraffin wax. Next, the paraffinated tissue now becomes a block and the block is sectioned with sharp knives into thin sections that are placed on a glass slide. That thin section will enable light to be transmitted through the tissue and then it can be observed with a light microscope. The sections can also be made if the tissue is frozen and this gives a very rapid way of handling the tissues. They are called frozen sections. Next, the tissue section is stained with dyes to help distinguish between different components of the tissue. For instance, the nucleus will be stained differently from the cytoplasm and then the extracellular fibers will also be stained differently so that they can be observed. Routine staining method used is called H and E. H stands for hematoxylin and E stands for eosin. They are both dyes. So histochemistry refers to the study of the tissues at light microscopy using dyes or other chemical reagents. Immunohistochemistry which is currently very important and immunofluorescence, you have reagents that are either poly, poly or monoclonal antibodies that are linked chemically to the enzymes of fluorescent dyes and you are able to detect changes based on these reagents. Other techniques that are used on tissue include electron microscopy, you can do biochemical uh, re reactions on them and then you can do microbiological techniques and then also molecular biology techniques. The challenge to the student studying pathology is that he must become abreast with the language used in medicine and also the processes that this course will try to make students aware of. These terms must be learned so that they are not confused with each other because accurate meaning is very important in describing disease. Language involves the terms. For instance, a term like hyperplasia means increase in size of an organ due to increase in number by proliferation of the constituent cells. It cannot be used in any other way. Process means that learning a disease must include learning the mechanisms and their effects on individual patients and also organs. So let's move on to topic two, where we are going to learn the characteristics of disease. 
First, what is disease? Definition. It is a condition in which the presence of an abnormality of the body causes a loss of normal health. It is not the mere presence of abnormality. You may also define a disease as a clinical manifestation through signs and symptoms of an underlying functional and or structural abnormality. So what are the characteristics of disease? They are the features of the disease that distinguishes the disease from others. You can study the characteristics of disease under the following headings. A name that comes along with the definition. Etiology, the cause of the disease. Pathogenesis, manifestations, complications, diagnosis. The epidemiology, the prognosis, treatment. So we are going to discuss each characteristic of disease. We are going to start with etiology. Etiology refers to the cause of disease. It is the initiator of the subsequent events resulting in illness. There is interplay between the host, genetic factors, and the environment. General categories of etiological agents include genetic abnormalities, infectious agents like viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasites, chemicals, and then physical agents like trauma and radiation. A disease of unknown cause is classified as primary or idiopathic or essential or spontaneous or cryptogenic. So any disease that is preceded by this term means that we do not know the cause. Now when the cause is not known, there are things or there are factors that may be associated with the disease. One of them is the risk factor. A disease that the cause is unknown may be found commonly in people with a common characteristic or trait. For instance, their occupation, life habits, for instance, smoking. They may be found in the geographical location or within the family. Individuals in the group who are more likely to have the disease or at increased risk of developing the disease form a characteristic because of that particular common characteristic that they all have, either occupation or life habits. So those group characteristics are referred to as risk factors. Risk factors make it easy for the development of a disease in an individual. For instance, cigarette smokers get lung infections more commonly and they also develop cancer. So the risk factors may provide clues to the causative agents. For instance, in the cigarette smoke, there are agents in the smoke that cause the cancer. Now predisposing predisposition is another factor that we need to consider in unknown diseases. This is an increased risk of having a disease or other condition. It can be genetic predisposition or other kind of predisposition. A genetic predisposition influences the phenotype of the organism and can be modified by environmental conditions. A predisposition can also be environmental, such as malnutrition, which increases the risk of other conditions. Some infections can predispose to other infections by other organisms. Some of these organisms may not normally be harmful and, and, and cause disease. For instance, AIDS, which is caused by HIV infection, can predispose to opportunistic infections such as pneumocystis.
The third factor that we want to consider is causal association. A marker for a risk of developing disease, but not necessarily the cause. This is determined by statistical analysis. And the stronger the causal association, the more likely the disease is caused by that particular factor. The strongest causal associations are found in infectious diseases. For instance, tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now, before this is established, you will first notice a statistical uh, association between tuberculosis and the organism, mycobacterium tuberculosis. And the stronger that is, the more likely the disease is caused by the organism. The next characteristic is pathogenesis. Pathogenesis comes from suffering and creation. Pathos means suffering and creation means genesis. So it means the processes and mechanisms or pathways of events through which the cause acts to produce the effects. In other words, how the cause brings about the disease. That is the pathogenesis. It is a process and it is a method or mode of action used in achievement of the disease process. Many groups of etiological factors or agents may lead to disease through the same pathway. For instance, inflammation. In later sessions, we shall learn about inflammation. It's just the response of vascularized living tissue to injury. And this may be due to microorganisms or harmful agents that cause tissue injury. Bacteria, heat, trauma. So all these causes cause inflammation. Therefore, the etiology is bacteria and pathogenesis is inflammation. Then the next one is degeneration, where the cells and tissues deteriorate. Carcinogenesis. This is the mechanism by which cancer causing agents lead to tumors. Neoplasia. This is the formation of a tumor. Hypersensitivity reactions. This is when there is excessive undesirable effects of the body's immune system in response to innocuous agents. Other examples include hypertrophy, hyperplasia, and detrophy. Many of the terms that are mentioned here will be dealt with in subsequent sessions. A mechanism is a means by which effect or result is achieved. So pathogenesis is, an, is a mechanism. Example is acute inflammation. This is when you have a vascular phase with se several stages and a cellular phase also with several stages. Most diseases are caused by multiple pathogenetic processes. For example, certain cancers arise from a combination of genetic processes, biological agents, and dysfunction in the immune system. So what is the use of pathogenesis? First, let's see what we come across when we are dealing with bacterial infections. Incubation period and latent interval. Most etiologic agents do not give rise to manifestations immediately. So after exposure, some period passes before the causative agent enacts the pathogenetic processes that is called incubation period. And this lasts for days, weeks, or months. When it lasts for years, it is called a latent interval. The incubation period is usually quoted for bacteria and viral infections. It's usually characteristic of the agent. It is useful in quarantine or suspected sources of infections or to alert 
someone as to when to expect symptoms. If, let's say, he accidentally harms himself in an infectious environment. A key example is rabies. When a dog is suspected of having beaten someone and passed on rabies, incubation period of a few days, in addition to the disease process of an, a, a few extra days in a dog, means that the dog can be quarantined for about 11 days. And if he does not develop or die from rabies, then he can be declared not as not having rabies. And this is useful because the person who is bitten in the meantime would be given immunoglobulins as vaccination to prevent develop the development of rabies. That immunoglobulin will be stopped after 11 days if the dog is still alive. So knowing the incubation period is very useful. Now latent period is used in the context of diseases that have long period of pathogenesis, like neoplasia. Sometimes the period lasts decades between the cause and the manifestation. There are some infections which fall into this category, where we use, uh, we use latent period. For instance, tertiary syphilis. From the beginning of the infection to when tertiary syphilis will show maybe something between 20 and 30 years. So instead of saying incubation period, rather use latent period or interval. Now let's move on to the morphologic abnormalities and manifestation, which is another characteristic of disease. The etiologic agents will act through the pathogenesis to produce changes morphologic changes and also this would show as manifestation of disease. A lesion is used to describe the structural and functional abnormality responsible for ill health. It may lead to another lesion, in other words it may progress or change. For instance if you have an injury on the skin due to say a cutlass wound. That's an injury, it's a lesion. But it may become infected. If it becomes infected, it now will change from a simple injury to an abscess. A lesion may also be purely biochemical. In that not all illnesses are overtly visible. For instance, if you have a depressive illness. This is psychosomatic. You will not find anything, no matter the techniques that I have described using them. So it is a biochemical lesion that we cannot see. Manifestations of disease are the clinical signs and symptoms of disease. The complaints that a patient make are called symptoms. So we, uh, weight loss, headache, fever. The signs are what is found on examining the patient. For instance, high temperature, enlarged liver, enlarged limb. It is the features, the abnormal features of the lesions that account for these signs and symptoms. The term pathognomonic abnormality is a feature of a disease that when present make the diagnosis certain. Complications and sequelae, what are they? These are the prolonged secondary or distant effects of disease.
they occur during the disease, as a consequence of the disease, sometimes not necessarily an essential part of the disease. For instance, hypertension may lead to intracerebral hemorrhage or left ventricular failure. These are complications and also because they follow directly for the hypertension, they are also sequelae. Sequelae usually are a result of the disease itself and arise only by the disease. Complications, however, may result either from the disease or from an independent cause, maybe the treatment or the nursing, for instance, bed sores are a complication of a paralytic disease and they arise because of poor nursing. Prognosis. Prognosis means the outcome of the disease. It is the forecast or prediction of the known or likely outcome of or cause of disease. Now the patient is always interested in the prognosis. After you tell the patient what is wrong, what he wants to know is whether he's going to die or he's going to live. So a prognosis of the disease is very important, but may be influenced by the medical or surgical intervention. Prognosis factors, therefore, are factors that aid in predicting likely outcome or cause of a disease. For instance, stage of a disease is a, a term that usually occurs when cancer is being treated. The extent of spread of the disease, in this case a cancer, in the person is very important to predict the outcome. Grade is the severity of disease. So the poorer the grade, the poorer the prognosis. Presence or of complications, age of the person, these are all important factors in prognosis. Epidemiology. This is the study of disease in population. Sometimes it's referred to as pathology of populations. So it concerns the identification of the causes and modes of acquisition of disease. It also involves the recording and analysis of data about disease in groups of people rather than individual person. It is important for providing etiological clues, the risk factors, predisposing factors. You can use it to plan preventive measures, for instance, immunization, population screening for early diagnosis for instance, for cancers. These are important uses of epidemiology. They also have tools. You calculate rates to help you predict and to plan. For instance, incidence rate. This is the number of new cases of the disease occurring in the population of a defined size during a defined period helps you know how many new cases you are getting. Prevalence rate is the number of cases of disease to be found in the defined population at a stated time. Again, this gives you the disease burden. You know how much you have to deal with at any given time. Other rates that can be calculated and used as epidemiological tools are survival rate, mortality rate, case fatality rate. Let's take some of them and talk about them. Morbidity and mortality. Morbidity of a disease is the sum of its effects on the patient. And morbidity may or not lead, may not lead to disability or loss of function or ending power. Mortality of a disease is the probability that death will be the outcome. It's usually expressed as a rate infant mortality rate, maternal mortality rate, 
uh, examples. You express this as a number of deaths per population per year. So you have a number, say 20 population thousand per year. So you can express the 20 over 1,000 as a percentage. Let's use the crude death rate as an example. This is the total number of deaths per year per 1,000 people. The crude death rate for the whole world is currently about 8.23 per 1,000 per year. 400 years ago, it was about 40 per thousand per year. So there has been improvement. Case fatality rate is the percentage presenting with the disease who die. So if nine people per 10,000 presenting with the disease die, then you have nine per 10,000. And it's also over a, a, a period of a year. It helps to tell how deadly the disease is at a glance. For instance, if you compare these diseases, Spanish influenza, which occurred after the First World War, the case fatality rate was just slightly above 2.5%. Then the Asian and Hong Kong flu, the bird flu, and all those flus that recently came up the case fatality rate was 0 0.1. So immediately you can see that the Spanish influenza was worse than the Asian and Hong Kong flu. Most of the influenza epidemics that have gone around the world are around 0.1%. Now compare this to Ebola. The first time this disease was identified was in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo in, in the 1970s. And the case fatality rate was 90%. Recent epidemics in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, the fatality rate has dropped to about 60 to 70%. So you can have any disease and have a table of the characteristics. The name and definition and the example we are using is a boil. The technical name for that is a foronco. You can put in the cause. The usual cause is Staphylococcus aureus. The pathogenesis will be acute inflammation. The morphologic or clinical findings are abscess. That is what a boil, the proper name for a boil is. This is the painful, tender, warm mass that we get sometimes in the armpit or somewhere else. Complication, it can become a blood-borne infection called septicemia. Epidemiology, it's a common. It's common in the population, and many people get it in the hairy areas of the body. Prognosis is very good. It stays for some time and then disappears, whether you take medicine or not. So this is how you can study disease and follow it using the characteristics of disease. Please find time to write on a patient who presented at the clinic with fever, vomiting, low hemoglobin, and was diagnosed and treated successfully for malaria. Draw a table of characteristics of disease for this patient. And this is the end of this topic. We'll now move on to the nomenclature. How do we name diseases? Nomenclature is a systemic way of giving names to diseases and disease processes to provide unique identification. When a disease is primary, it means there is no antecedent cause. 
There is no known cause. Other terms used for no known cause is essential, spontaneous, cryptogenic, idiopathic. So if the disease is of no known cause, you precede the name of the disease by one of these terms. For instance, essential hypertension. This forms about 90% of hypertension that occur in people. Then spontaneous pneumothorax. This is when air collects in the chest cavity spontaneously. And we don't know the cause. Now, cryptogenic pulmonary fibrosis means that there is fibrous tissue in the in lung. We don't know the cause. And then you have idiopathic thrombocytopenic pepper. This is bleeding due to defects in, thromb uh, in platelets that we don't know the cause. Now, primary is used in another form. It is also the initial stage of a disease. So for instance, you can say primary cancer. This is where the cancer started. The mass that forms there is the primary. Or primary tuberculosis. This is the first time you get tuberculosis. It's called primary. This is the first time you come in contact with the organism and get a disease. It's also primary. Secondary disease is when there's a complication or manifestation of an underlying disease. For example, secondary hypertension will mean that there is high blood pressure due to underlying disease like renal artery stenosis. This is when there's narrowing of the renal artery. So when there is a disease and it manifests as another disease, then the second disease will be a secondary disease. Now, secondary is also used for another, in another way. It's also used for a later stage of a disease when it is manifesting elsewhere in the body. For instance, secondary syphilis. Now, it presupposes that there is a primary syphilis. This usually occurs in the genital area. This is a, this is a, a, a venereal disease. But secondary syphilis is the second stage of the disease which manifests on the skin. The same thing can be used in tuberculosis, secondary tuberculosis. It means that this is the, either the second time the disease is occurring in the person or the primary one has been resurrected. You call it secondary tuberculosis because this is a later stage of the disease. Acute refers to the dynamics of disease. It's usually used in inflammatory conditions. It means rapid onset with rapid resolution. For patients, when they say they've got something acute, they mean sharp or severe. But pathology, acute means the dynamics, how quickly it started and quickly it went away. That is acute. Chronic is also dynamics. It means prolonged. It doesn't start quickly. It uh, starts what we say insidiously. It's like it's coming and it's not coming, then it comes. And then when it comes, it stays for a long time. Then you say it's chronic. Benign is another term that is used. This is uh, in reference to the outcome of a disease. When the outcome is good, then it's termed benign. So for instance, in tumors, when you say a benign tumor, you mean the one that would not normally lead to death. It will not spread or kill you. Unless it is in a site like in the brain or somewhere else where it is dangerous to be, then it may kill. Otherwise, it is a good outcome. So example is benign hypertension. This is high blood pressure, but it progresses slowly and damages the tissues very slowly and gradually. So it does not usually kill. People with benign hypertension will die from other 
causes, not the hypertension. Malignant, the likely outcome is bad. So if you use it for uh, a tumor, then it's a malignant tumor. It will kill in due time, if not removed. And even when it is removed, most of the time it will still kill. So malignant tumors are equal to cancers. They, 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 are, they are not good outcome. When you use it for other diseases like hypertension, it also shows that the hypertension is rapidly progressive and will kill if nothing is done. There is severe tissue damage and uh, severe symptoms. Patient can die. So the terms that precede the disease names tell you whether it's severe, it is good prognostic or otherwise. Now how about giving names to the diseases themselves? There are two parts of the name. The first part is the prefix, and the ending part is called the suffix. So, prefixes have meaning. If a word representing a disease starts with an, for instance, then it means there's an absence of something. So, for instance, anemia means lack of blood. This means there's disordered. Dysplasia means disordered proliferation. Hyper means there is excess, above normal. For instance, hypertension, high blood pressure. Hypo means there's a deficiency or is below normal. Hypotension, low blood pressure. Meta means change from one state to the other. So we will come across terms like metaplasia which means it changes from one type of cell to the other. Then the ending portions also have meanings. If there's an abnormal state, you will end it in opathy. If you end it in OMA, OMA, then you are talking about a tumor or a swelling. If it is EMIA, EMIA, then it's pertaining to blood. Penia means a lack or reduced number. Cytosis means increased number of cells. Plasia has to do with disorder of growth. Osis just refers to an abnormal condition. ITIS, itis, is how we usually end diseases which are inflammatory in nature. OID or OID means it resembles and ecstasy means there is dilatation. So after naming them we group the diseases. That is classification. We classify diseases to group them under general etiology or common mechanisms of causation. For etiology we have two main ways. Either it is genetic or it is non-genetic. So there, there is one classification, genetic or non-genetic diseases. It's the same or equivalent to genetic or environmental because the non-genetic diseases are environmental diseases. Then there is another way, congenital or acquired classification. Congenital means born with the condition. The condition we are born with may be genetic or non-genetic. We may have it in our genes or it is because of the environment of the womb or uterus that gives the disease. Acquired diseases in this case mean that after birth of the person this disease occurs due to environmental agents. Since a lot of diseases are environmental or acquired, you can sub-classify them into inflammatory, 
example, acute appendicitis, vascular diseases, example, myocardial infarction, which is the common, common way we get heart attacks, growth disorders like leukemia, injury or disordered repair, like when we have fractures of the bone, metabolic and degenerative diseases like diabetes, mellitus, and then iatrogenic. This is due to medical personnel. Say, you go to the clinic, you are suffering from something, and you are given an injection by the medical practitioner, and then you develop an abscess. You call it injection abscess. This is iatrogenic. It was because of what you were treated with. Drug reactions also fall under these iatrogenic causes. So, a question, your question again. A patient presented at a clinic with fever, vomiting, low hemoglobin and was diagnosed and treated successfully for malaria. Draw a table of the characteristics of disease. This brings us to the end of the first session.